we're now looking at two films by macho macho directors from the 70s. Well, the directors came of age in the 70s, John Melius and Walter Hill. But the films, Warriors is from the late 70s and Conan Barbarian is from the early 80s. Now, that, this is when these two directors were at their peak, like, financially. I mean, um, they both had career collapses in the early 90s, really, which they never really recovered from. I would say of the two, Melius is the most distinctive one. Melius has the better CV for interesting, unique films. Walter Hill has been more touch and go, really. He has some really high, good high spots and some really good professional films. But I think he was the less curious of the two directors and I'm not sure if he always was doing the films he really wanted to do. He was much more a journeyman director for me even though there's some really good high points. But they were both directors who dealt with genre. Well, Hill was much more linked to genre than Milius was. And they were both viewed as people who did macho films. You know, but I think Milius, tend, even though he was viewed as the most right-wing of the two, actually had more, you know, human characters and square a lot of his films. You know, less genre-based genre characters within genre films. So, um... I'm probably going to do more from these both these directors in the future, but I'm combining both these films. I saw them pretty close together. I saw them both projected. These are both films I've not watched for a while, but I've seen quite a lot in the past. Um, so I'll start with The Warriors, because that's the earliest film. The Warriors is a Walter Hill film. It's, it's what the Walter Hill kind of films I like most. The late 70s stuff, early 80s. When he was still quirky a director, he was making stuff like this, Streets of Fire, 40 Hours, The Driver. You know, much more pared down, you know, um, he did one with Charles Bronson and James Coburn, Hard Times. These are all quirky character stuff with good action. And they were just really enjoyable, they were really spare. He did Southern Comfort as well, which was a kind of deliverance riff. And he did Long Riders, which was enjoyable, but maybe not his best. But he was doing a lot of really cool films here. But my favourites are actually the other fantastical ones, like this and Streets of Fire, where he was creating a mood, just creating a world that didn't exist, but was fantastical and just so cinematic. It's almost like a musical version of an action movie. Like, uh, in this one, he actually hired dancers to do the action stuff to give it a kind of grace that actual non, like just action stuntmen wouldn't have. So the film is basically based on the on a novel and Hill said he took a lot of stuff from myth as well. It's basically these guys, the warriors, who have to go to this big meeting up in the centre of New York where there's lots of gangs all over. The gangs rule the street at night. The cops just watch them and try and arrest them when they can. And they go to this meeting where they're going to try and... This leader, Cyrus, is going to actually... Is it Cy Cyrus the leader or the guy? I can't remember. But he's going to be... the guy, This guy's going to lead all the gangs into one group to actually take over the city. And of course he gets shot by one of the gangs and the warriors are framed for the killing and they have to get from the centre of the city back home to Coney Island you know, through the night. If the first half of the night, people are wondering why people are after them. Because they think, at the start, they just think they're trying to get home. They've lost their leader. So, the guy, Swan, who's played by Michael Beck, had to take over. And he's got, um, Ajax, played by, um, James Remar, on his back all the time, because he wants to be a leader. They have to get home, and for the first time, they just think they're trying to avoid gangs and get to trains and join up. They don't realise that people are after them for killing the big, the big man, basically. Or they look through the nickname, the one and only. Until he dies. And then, once they realise that, they, know, they realise how much trouble they're actually in. But it is an episodic story. They're going from place to place. And they're running to different gangs. And all the gangs are stylized to look different. And you've got one gang that's, um... You know, dressed in baseball outfits. And they've got the face paint. You've got skinhead gangs. You've got this lesbian gang. There's gangs all over the place, all distinct, they're all different. It's very comic booky, so you always know who's who. But you also know that these gangs are all dangerous. 
But it's campy as well. It's not trying to be reality. They take it far apart enough from humanity so you know that if this was a real world city, they'd be dead in two minutes. Right. There's no way. So they, they made it more fantastical so you can accept the fact they're going from place to place and they're not being caught. You know it's not a real film. Not, not, not a film based on reality. And this is wonderful about it. There's this gang they run into early on called the Orphans, which, who are not invited because they were too low class. And those guys are really jealous and they get beaten to hell. <laughs> this is an enjoyable film because it has so much about fantasy. It's so much about the fantasy of being a gang. You know, it's the idea of what a child thing a gang is, which is all about the colours and all about the fights, the exciting fights. It's not like a realistic view of gangs in any way. They're all too, well, decent really. The, the gang of fallen warriors are tough, but they're also, they're not vicious or anything. They're just trying to get home. A lot of the other gangs are after them, are after them for a reason. And there's only like one really nasty gang, which is the gangs who set them up. So it's a, it's a set of gangs who are way nicer than they, they would be in real life. But there is hints of life in here. The whole idea is why the gang's here. Because these are the, the people who have been thrown away in the city. These are the people who have no future. And that's Palmer's home again and again. The idea that these guys are in gangs because they come from streets that don't have any future. So they've created their own little turfs in different neighbourhoods. That, that's the one thing they can control. Which makes it difficult through different gang areas because they're controlling that part of the, their world. That's the only control they've got. So it's always there. So it's a fluent thing of these working class people. And there's a nice scene towards the end where they're actually on a train and these rich people suddenly appear. And it's like, it's two groups of people from a different world. Because the rich will never know what they have gone through. Where how they have to struggle to survive and these rich people don't, just don't have a clue. So it's wonderful in that way. There's a sense of these people, as you get to know them more, is the idea that they're just trying to survive. They're... The poor people and uh, the Michael Beck characters actually think they're just leaving New York altogether because you'd like to travel a bit. And there's just this sense of rot because by the time they get home to Coney Island, they look around where they came, where they've been traveling all right to, and it's like, we've been through all that for this, which is this wreckage of an urban desolation. It's like, that's where we're fighting to get back to. And I watched this as a projector and actually what's really interesting is something you don't get when you're watching TV is all this, all of New York, all the streets, how wrecked they feel and how desolate. No matter what they do to them, they feel desolate and it just feels like this. It feels like a real journey from place to place and when you see it projected. But you see it in TV, it just feels like a really cool action movie. But you actually see it projected, it feels a lot bigger and a lot more epic. And it feels like the story is progressing in much more interesting ways because you're going from location to location, each location is slightly different, each location you've got the, the cartoonish foreground of the characters that are, that are void and you also have this background of desolation, it's always like they put all this stuff on just to stand out in this area. And but they're running through place to place and each place just feels like a living hell. And it's people just trying to survive and they run into a, a woman who tags along with them because she wants out of her area because she loves where the orphans are. And she causes trouble from the start. But as they go on, you get to see her point of view as well. Why she sticks with the, with the warrior and we even know it's dangerous. Like she just wants something in her life rather than just be stuck in the house. Because she sees all these people who are already married and their lives are over. So the film is... It's got some grip to it, but it's also just got this sense of a wonderful, fantastic world of these fights that are... Yeah, they're done, they're done with um, athletes who can fight and make it look beautiful. They also remember to make one of the characters awful. He must have said most of the gangs feel like fantasy. The James Weimar character in this, he's a bit dodgy. He's like the one who's basically gets arrested by the police because he tries to assault a woman. So he's the one character who's like, okay, these gangs are a bit more dangerous, potentially. So he's the one who's the troublemaker. So that's 
they do remember just to add a lot about that. But most of the time it's about the, fant the fantasy of the world, the fates, slow motion jumping through walls and things and Water Hill was very good at finding ways to use slow motion because he's very, he was influenced by Sam Peckinpah. He wrote for Sam Peckinpah with the getaway. He's interested in um, the stylization of action and violence. You know, it wasn't really about reality with him. It's, some of his better films were when reality was pushed to the side and it was just like, it's a fantasy world. Let's just go with it. Or it was some of the 40 hours where we had characters that were really interesting. You could actually watch them play off each other. As his career beyond, went beyond this, I think... I mean, The Warriors was a hit, but Streets of Fire was a massive bomb. That was a film just after 40 hours. That was his big film after 40 hours. It was a big hit. And it bombed. And I, th I think he lost his confidence. He started churning these films that were not as good, like the 40 hours sequel. There was... Extreme Prejudice and Red Heat... I mean, there were some films he did in the 90s I like, with uh, Trespass and World Bill and stuff like that, that they weren't the same level of what he was before, but they, at least they were, well, the Philip Motor Hill films, there was uh, Johnny Handsome, which was very flawed, but I quite liked as well. But at some point his career just collapsed, because his films were not making money. Geronimo was terrific, and it made nothing. It was just a case of, he went out of fashion, and people were not going to see his kind of films, and it was like, the films he wanted to make were films that no one wanted to see, so he just kind of fell off, fell off the cliff basically. And he's come back a few times recently, but the films haven't been as good, and there's just been lack of interest. It's just a sense that the world's moved on from Walter Hill films. But there's some really good stuff from his youth. You know, there's a lot of good stuff there. It's just that there's a lot of middling stuff. His career's kind of the good stuff's been swamped out by the later kind of weaker stuff. John Melius is more interesting. His career collapsed quicker because he was more publicly uh, right wing and he annoyed a lot of people, so his career collapsed a lot quicker. But his films are way more distinct than Motor Hill's films. They really are. I mean, he even worked with Motor Hill a few times. He wrote the story of Extreme Prejudice and he wrote this, an early draft of the script for Geronimo, which feels very John Millius, even though it's, it was rewritten quite a bit, but there was a lot of stuff in there that feels John Milliusy. I did a video on Geronimo last year, so you can look at that if you want to see that. Um, this one, Conan, was one of his bigger hits. I mean, Millius was famous for... He wrote, he wrote Dirty Harry. He wrote, you know, he did Dillinger. He wrote and directed Dillinger. He wrote the... Famous scene from Jaws but Indianapolis, or he co wrote it. He did a lot of the really good stuff on it. And then it was edited down by Robert Shaw. He's done little bits and balls for Spielberg. You know, he helped Zemeckis early on in his career. He did Win the Lion, Big Wednesday, which is a big bomb, but it was a really good film. It's one of my favourite films. This is his follow up to Big Wednesday. He'd go on to do Red Dawn, which was terrifically weird and wonderful and he would uh, do um, Farewell to the King which is very underrated he did Flight of the Intruder which didn't do very well when that was his career then he went on TV and he did a couple of interesting things he did Rough Riders which is actually interesting to look at so, so even though he's, his career didn't do that great later he always seemed to do John Millie's projects I'm sure a lot of projects didn't get made but they always felt like John Millie's films and even though he was writing with characters about larger than life and stuff like Red Dawn, it was about brothers and the people surviving in rage and Big Wednesday was dealing with people dealing with growing up and actually maturing. You know, Dylan Joe was about bank robber, but it was a lot of character stuff. And Conan, even though it's a big silly Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, about a time that never existed, it's still a terrific fantasy about cults and um, surviving in a world that's pretty much like it's barbaric I mean there's a reason why it's called Conan of Barbarian he's in a world that is really brutal and people uh, fight each other and do horrible things to each other and so you take you from Conan from a child watching his his family's um, village be attacked and being burned down by James L. Jones's uh, cult gang which are almost like biker gangs and horses 
coming and attacking a town. Then uh, you see Arnold, uh, he was sort of slavery, and he actually, uh, you see him grow up pushing this big boulder that I think um, is for flour to turn uh, wheat into whatever you do with wheat. <laughs> it's very vague what he's doing, he's, he's moving this thing around. He's talking a lot of the minds up by Hedges, Arnold himself. And then you go through the um, him actually becoming a being taught how to fight because he's so big and he's a good warrior. How he earns his freedom and then he ends up going through the lands and discovering his pal, his, his thief pal, fighting a witch, you know, run into another pal who, who this woman, this blonde woman who he becomes an item with and then they basically have to go and rescue this woman. From the from Salsa Doom, we find we realise this is the person who killed his parents. He has to get revenge. All of this is uh, it's an, like the Warriors is very episodic, and um, again, it's very distinctive. It's distinctive to this world. They created this world that was uniquely. Uh, everything feels right for whatever this fantasy is. That it feels right. If everything feels. It's serious, the world where anyone can die at any time. It feels like a pretty much Dark Age, Middle East type of thing. That's what it feels like. And the, the, the snake cult of Thulsa Doom is supernatural. And, and there is one place with this massive snake and people are sacrificed to it. There's, this, this is a barbarity and superstition. And it's wonderfully done. Again, I managed to watch this on a projector so you get to see the world a lot more. It's a bit slow paced this one compared to uh, some of Melissa's other films which tend to go quicker. This one takes its time as you go through different stages of basically um, Conan learning and Conan making mistakes. And plus Schwarzenegger that was very early in his career so he was not much of an actor. He never was much of an actor but he got a lot better as it went on. This one, they're working around him a lot of time but Melius manages to make him work for the part. But it just means you don't have a dynamic character in the centre of the film. It's more about the mood of the film and watch them do all these cool stuff. There's some really good uh, actors and support though. You've got Max Van Sydow turning up as the father of the of the, the, the princess that's been kidnapped. He's a king and he's gonna he's way over the top in this film. You don't usually see Sid Van Sydow go this far over the top. He's having a way over time. It's like, um, okay, I'm not doing Bergman this time. I'm just going way over the top. And it seems Millie's loved that. <laughs> you have uh, James L. Jones as Thulsa Doom. And he's got all these massive muscle men as his sidekicks who are all, all getting brutalised one after another through the film as Arnold kills them. But, but him and his voice and just this sense of, yeah, he's this cult leader who can hypnotise people with his eyes. And he's got supernatural elements. And it's just perfect. Perfect casting. And you just... I instantly believe he would create this cult. He would... He could, the, the character they create feels very believable and someone who has to be taken down. It just works really well, this part. I mean, everything really works. It's just a very long film. Or it feels very long. It feels like it's, it could lose 10 minutes somewhere. But I don't care. I really enjoy it. I mean, even though I think it's a bit long, I still really enjoy it. So I don't really mind those little long girls here or there. I mean, it's, it's one of those films that feels there's nothing you take care of, just little bits of pacing. They could have been a bit faster, but doesn't matter. The actual mood of it, maybe if you cut those stuff out, the mood would be gone. So maybe it's a film that's always doomed to be imperfect. But it's a film I watch every... So it's not like The Warriors. I don't watch it all the time, but I watch it enough. That every so often I get the mood to, to watch Conan. You know, and there's so much good stuff. I mean, them, them trying try the... Um, a drunk Arnold punching a camel is always worth seeing, you know. Uh, Arnold uh, and they been crucified by Thulsa Doom's people and all these um, birds around him ready to peck at, his, peck at his body once he's dead and he ends up biting the neck of one of them. You know, and he, he goes through this thing where they try to save his life and uh, the cover of his face, like in Quidon, you know. So, um, there's lots of influence by other films, but it all feels like a culture that makes sense to you a culture that's vibrant and interesting and weird and this massive cult at the center that's taking over 
the the mind of the young all the young are going to this it's, it's like a belief system this is the purity they need to actually enter heaven or find meaning for their lives and it's just a, just a con <laughs> and the end's been brilliant because um, Schwarzenegger just walks up and talks to doom and just chops his head off after he's done this after Kim Jong Jones has massive speech but without me you've been nothing I'm, I created you and then I'm your true father and then he throws the head down the steps and you see all these lights of all the, all the followers just slowly fall away and it's a wonderful sequence there's lots of little stuff like that in the film made, so it's obviously made by a smart director who's making a bit of pulp it's that kind of feeling of he's taking this probably a bit too seriously but but it's really wonderful really enjoyable so I, I'd highly recommend re-watching Conan the Baby or watching it it's really enjoyable there's lots of fun stuff and it is made by a director who knows what he's doing and he has taken pulp and elevating it into sort of weird craziness I mean, there's other Millie's films I like more, though. I mean, I prefer, I much prefer Big Wednesday. I prefer Red Dawn because it is a bit this big event, but it's also a bunch of young people trying to deal with it and not dealing with it very well. That's more interesting. Um, Dillinger, One the Line are both better. I much prefer Fear to King, even though it's cut to hell. So there's a lot of films that Millie's I like more than this, but this is still a very enjoyable film. You know, it was a film he, he came out with after the uh, Apocalypse Now came out and he'd written Apocalypse Now. So this is his big return <laughs> as a director. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it interests you and uh, I'll see you later. Right, bye for now.